Okay, so I would like to uh, reconvene our, our regular board meeting uh, for the uh, month of January. Uh, we have been in executive session to review past ex <coughs> executive session minutes and uh, review the pos possibility of releasing them. Uh, the actions that we have decided to take in executive session uh, have been the approval of the minutes from the executive <coughs> sessions of July 11, 2017, November 14, 2017, and December 5th of 2017. Uh, we then <coughs> looked at the ability or appropriateness of releasing uh, unreleased minutes of past executive sessions and came to the conclusion that we would release um, the three new sets of minutes, namely July 11, 2017, November 14, 2017, and December 5th of 2017. And furthermore, we decided to release the minutes from March the 14th of 2017. Lastly, the board decided it is appropriate under law to authorize the destruction of existing recordings of executive session minutes that are now more than 18 months old. And this includes the recordings of the executive sessions of January 12th, 2016, March 8, 2016, April 5th, 2016, and April 12th of 2016. And we have thus approved those destructions. Well. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, I got it. Take it all. <laughs> Okay, so moving on. Um, our next item of business is to accept or modify the remaining agenda for tonight's meeting. So do we, I don't, I'm not aware of any desired changes in the agenda, is there? I move we accept the agenda Second. as presented. Second. That's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the point? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Nightmare. And uh, I believe there is not a an update report uh, tonight. Given public that there comment. Hmm? There's no public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I I zipped right by the public comment. <laughs> There's also I don't see anybody here from the public to make <laughs> comment, and there are no new staff introductions. Right. And there's not an update report, <laughs> which brings us to our consent agenda, and. On our consent agenda this evening, our approval of the minutes of the December 5th study 2017 study session, approval of minutes of the December 7th joint board meeting with the Champaign Park District for CU Special Recreation, although we did not have a quorum there, but I guess we still approve the minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, approval of the minutes of the December 12th, 2017 regular board meeting, action to accept the philanthropy philanthropy report and gifts listed with gratitude. Uh, acceptance of the monthly reports to wit are the administrative department, the planning and operations, and the recreation department. Approval of the monthly paid accounts payable. Approval of commissioner travel, meal, and lodging expenses. Approval of employee travel, meal, and lodging expenses. Those are the items that are on the consent agenda at the moment. It is the purview of any commissioner to remove any or all of these items uh, for separate discussion and action. Is there any, any item that any commissioner wants removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, is there somebody willing to I'm, make I'm, a motion? Yeah, I um, <laughs> move to approve all the action items on the consent agenda and accept all the information items listed on the consent agenda in an omnibus manner. Second. That's been moved and seconded, and under our rules, there's to be no further discussion, and we should uh, hold a roll call vote given all the items that are on it. We'll start to the left with LaShonda. Aye. 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 And that carries unanimously with the four commissioners present. So that moves us on to reports, financial reports. Well, good evening, everyone. Tonight I'll be talking to you about the financial performance of the Park District for the month of December 2017. 
The first report I'll be discussing is the fund balance report. This is the report um, that shows receipts and expenditures for the prior 12 month period, the budget for the current period, and the preliminary unaudited results for the eight months ending December 31st. Sum one is the first page, and this is all funds except for the capital improvements fund. Revenues for this period were 8,133,000, which is an increase of 98,000 since November. 6.6 million of our revenues are property taxes and we've received more than 99% of our property taxes at this point. Um, I'm still expecting one little piddly payment. It's not related to, it's related to back taxes. So we'll see if that ever comes. Um, Expenditures for this period were 6,445,000, which is a change of 2,005,000 since November, largely due to our bond payments that were made in December. We have a surplus after eight months, and this means there was an excess of revenues over expenditures paid of $1,688,000, and a net change in fund balance shows an increase to fund balance after eight months of $1,688,000. Sum two shows only the capital improvements fund. And there were some big changes to this report in December as well. So revenues for this eight month period were 186,000 and expenditures were 545,000. Expenditures exceed revenues, which means there was a deficit of 359,000. However, bond proceeds of 710,000 were received on December 5th. So we have a total of other sources of 710,000, which then leaves a net increase in fund balance in the capital improvements fund of 351,000. That will be continue to be spent down throughout the rest of the fiscal year as we continue to complete projects. And sum three is all funds district wide. It's the sum of the first two pages added together. And you can note the very bottom line on the right side, right hand column, that the ending fund balance for the whole district is $8,474,000 at this point in the year. And following that are the summary reports for the individual uh, working funds, general recreation, museum, and indoor pool. And if you don't have any questions about the fund balance report, I'll move on to the next one. The next report is called the Budget Analysis with History Report. This report shows a historical comparison of the same eight-month period of the current year and the prior three years. So we're at 67% through our fiscal year, and that's a number you can use somewhat to compare throughout this report. The first section of this report, the full first page and half of the second page, is the total revenues and transfers in for the district. So you can see on the middle of the second page, that this total for this eight month period was 11,377,000. And as you can note on the first page, we have received 99% of our property taxes, which are all spelled out on the first page. In December, we completed the second half of the budgeted transfers that are related to our bond payments for the series 2010 and 2011 bond payments. The first step was completed in November, which was the transfer of funds from the Museum and Recreation Fund to the General Fund. And then in December, we complete the other side of that transfer, which moves the, uh, the appropriate amount of funds from the General Fund to the Bond Fund, excuse me, in order to make our bond payments that were due by December 15th. And we made those payments on December 7th, and they were equal to $1.6 million. Um, so you can see those transfers um, are also on page one as you go through uh, the transfer from the general fund was $1,039,200 related to, that's, that's both um, the amount that was transferred to the land acquisition fund earlier in the year and also the amount that we transferred for bond payments out of the general fund. So expenditures are all running rateably consistent with prior three years. In fact, uh, still throughout, after eight months, the majority of our expenditures are running better than the prior three years. So I'm really pleased with our performance this year. Um, There's a couple of outliers to that. Utilities are always going up. Full-time salaries always go up. A lot of those things are expected. So um, it's, I think we've just had really good performance this year. And you can see at the bottom of page three, that total expenditures and transfer Transfers out for this period were 9,338,000 with a surplus at the end of December of $2,039,000. And if you don't have any questions about that, we can move on to 
the next report. I did have a question about yes, please. the revenue total. I mean, sure. that's, that's sort of one thing that's, that stands out here. It look, looks like we, got, we received <coughs> about 87% of the budgeted what revenue. Page are you on, Michael? Oh, I'm sorry. This is on page two. Page two. It's the, the revenue line, the total. Sure. Which Some seems like a, I mean, it's not a huge differential, but, but as, as a percentage, it's well, A lot of that's low. timing, to be honest. So if you look through um, last year and the prior three years, we'd received our TIF reimbursement. But the, with the new TIF agreement that we have with the city, they won't entertain a, re we used to request that reimbursement in July, and they won't re uh, entertain a reimbursement until after the final property taxes have been received. So I've actually just been in communication with Derek in the last month or so, because we just received our final property tax payments to start that process to get that bill out. And it'll be about $110,000, so that'll help with that budgeted amount. Um, but if you look through, I mean, the other items, any other transfers that haven't been made yet, for example. So I think it's just a timing issue. As far as the actual earned revenues, I think we're tracking. Um, the next report I'll speak about, well, that was a good question. So thank you for your question. Um, the next report I'll speak about is the treasurer's report. So this is a report of the amount of cash the district has on one day, December 31st, 2017. All 24 funds are listed with where the cash is invested for a grand total of $10,228,891.81. On page two, the first section here lists amounts in interest-bearing accounts. So of the total $10,229,000 that we have, 8,902,000 is out in investments. The next section lists interfund loans. And finally, the third section, or the last section on the third page, lists our disbursements. And as I mentioned earlier, we had disbursements this month of $2,059,000, um, $1.6 million of that was bond payments, which you can see represented in the bond fund number, $1,620,000 was for bonds. Um, total, so, um, but anyway, other than the bond, bond payments, the disbursements were pretty typical for a month. So um, with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And otherwise, I present the treasurer's report to you for approval. I move we accept the treasurer's report for audit. Second. That's been moved and seconded. Are there any further, any further discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries unanimously. Great. Well, I have a couple more reports to talk about. The next one is the supplemental report of cash. This <coughs> is the same information as the first page of the treasurer's report, but it groups the information by expected use rather than by fund name. So it gives us a better idea of how our funds are being spent rather than what funds they're in. So the three expected uses are daily operating funds, restricted special needs, and restricted gifts and donations. So of that same $10,229,000, $1,268,000 is restricted, leaving $8,961,000 available as spendable cash. And um, if anybody needs a reminder about the restricted obligations, it's primarily taxes paid under protest by um, hospitals. So 1.1 million is um, in hold for presence from um, the TIF that, that expired, TIF 3, and the rest is our remaining obligation under the settlement agreement with Carl. And finally, the, I'll highlight the areas of activity in the capital budget. Those areas that had activity are, have an asterisk symbol next to them. So on the first page in the 2017 capital budget, there were revenues received for tributes. A donation was made to the park district for new playground equipment at the Sunnycrest hot lot for $2,300. Yeah, that's nice. The final installment of the Kimple funds were received from the foundation for reforestation in Crystal Lake Park and the Forest Preserve contributed their portion of the KRT connectivity study per the intergovernmental agreement. Expenditures occurred on ADA projects, tributes, reforestation in Crystal Lake, um, ITEP Park, uh, Park Street Path Engineering, Sediment Basin, and the Binker Demolition Project was completed. In the 2016 capital budget, 
This month's expenditures occurred on memorials, construction crew projects, and the sediment basin. And finally, um, if you're ready to move on, I know I'm going fast. Uh, in the 2015 budget, expenditures occurred on replacement memorial trees and on nature play interpretive panels. So there was only two highlight, highlighted activities in the 2015 budget. And now Andy and Derek may have some updates for you on capital projects. Yep, I'll uh, start with our UIAC pool pack air handling replacement. We have uh, the RFQ was advertised this last weekend. Uh, we're currently distributing two firms as they uh, request them. Those submissions are due January 19th. Uh, we'll be working with the school district to review uh, all the submissions and uh, do interviews. Um, we're looking to do an approval for the contract at the February board meeting. Mm. And then as a reminder, this is scheduled around the, the normal UIAC closure, mm -hmm. a three week period, um, shooting for July 21st. Would, that approval is for you, engineering services. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. February. And uh, just a be, reminder that the closing is usually two weeks. Okay. So this year we need to do a three week window um, just based on how quick they can get it up and running. Um, we're trying to beat them, get ahead of the game and, and get it ordered uh, and yep. built and um, possibly even on site to where we can move it up quickly. But we do think based on uh, information we received that may be a three week time frame to get it going. So yeah, because you don't have to just bolt, them, bolt it in place. You have to get it running. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Unhooked, and hooked there, back up. Yeah, and no burning it, the roof. There's no, it's not necessarily going to be the exact same unit. <coughs> right. Um, oh, so there, different footprint, yeah. There's better, mo better models and more efficient models, and we're also looking at some air handling. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say, isn't, isn't there actually the notion that, that the actual airflow in the facility may be modified somewhat in the yeah. process? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, uh, it's called a paddock style, where it'll actually bring up along the, the the floor of the pool and then um, help ventilate from that point as well, not just from up above on the ceiling. A lot of the newer pools on the indoor that we've seen mm -hmm. late, lately, at least we've seen that out at Clark Lindsay mm -hmm. is in the gutter mm -hmm. area. They actually have a, uh, a system that sucks the air right mm -hmm. from the gutter. Mm -hmm. So that any chloramines or whatever get away from the pool right there. At the oh, yeah, so they're not, they're not heading up right <coughs> to the gutter. Right down by the swimmer. Yep. It's yep. not an option for us, unfortunately, because you know, our gutters are already mm -hmm. built, but yep. they yep. do have these mm -hmm. uh, retrofit kits. And we've talked with Paddock historically at a couple conferences and always said when our day comes for our <laughs> pool pack unit, we'd like to talk to you more. So mm -hmm. that's included in the RFQ. And we're also interested in looking at the possibility of tying in a VFD so that we exhaust at a variable rate rather than a set okay. rate uh, mm -hmm. corresponding with the, the water quality and therefore the air quality. Um, but in talking with Poolpack, it, uh, independent of all that, they've made some improvements to the units themselves. Uh, they're um, more compact, more efficient, uh, but they still think that they have one that could, could fit our space. We're not wed to Poolpack. We're interested to see what our engineers come up with. But uh, it's clear that the, the, the industry has advanced quite a bit. Good. Good. <coughs> How, how old's that unit? That Second one. 11 that years, I think. I was going to say 13. You might be right. Something. 11. Yeah, and just off the top of my head from the RFQ, we had it in there, but I think it was 2006 or 2007 that it was replaced from the original unit. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was a fuzzy time. It was. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Busy with lots of things. <laughs> I think that's why I lost all the hair. Burned <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the chlorine just hit it. <laughs> but it didn't go gray. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. there are things to be. Yeah. You're fighting that, then. Um, I'm pleased to report that the permitting has been completed for our Saline Creek uh, habitat um, or rock riffle project. Um, Derek and I talked with IDNR. They're in the process of monitoring weather conditions and um, mobilization and purchasing of their materials. So right now they're shooting for an, sometime in February to begin construction. 
Um, we'll have a public meeting at the lake house at least a week, probably two weeks prior to that as well. The IDNR will be um, at as well. Um, I did want to note that um, due to some restrictions for tree work, the construction period may actually be split between spring and late fall. Um, what we were told is that between March 30th and October 15th, IDNR will not be able to take down uh, trees in a bat habitat area. So mm. that work may end up getting split depending on how much they can get done. Obviously, <laughs> the weather is going to be pretty highly dependent of that as well. So mm. we previously walked the stream corridor with a mammologist from the survey, and it was found to have suitable Indiana bat habitat. Not the actual presence of the bats, but suitable habitat. And so uh, tree removal anywhere in there needs to happen when uh -huh. the, right, when the they're bats not won't nesting. be. Yeah. And what, what, how do they describe suitable bat habitat? It's shaggy bark uh, that's sloughing off or lots of cavities. Um, oh. Sycamores are, are great. Um, oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Do, the, do the bats migrate away from the area? Or like, why would they not be there now? Uh, yeah, I think they're migratory, oh, and that's the period that, that they're in this area that they have to protect right. okay. their home there. They do that with all kinds of IDOT road projects, mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. too. Good. Derek, this could be our longest-running capital project. <laughs> Sorry. I think it actually <laughs> when the initial incident took place in the saline. Yeah, yeah. And when it started and we started mm -hmm. working. And when was it? Because I think we, just a little background, I think as soon as it happens, Derek and I followed up with a few discussion meetings just to anticipate, hey, if there's any cleanup, we have some sites that might be suitable. And that was many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And then we were told, well, well, we'll keep it in mind. And then it was sort of pushed away and then huh. pulled back. And then we've been on this ride for a good while. I want to thank everybody that's been working on it. There's good intent. There's just a very complicated situation. There was the whole legal thing and upfront resolution impact study and getting everybody on board and getting to yes and now the bats <laughs> right <laughs> uh, our king park court rehab that includes the tennis courts on the west side half court basketball half court bank shot uh, basketball um, we received cost estimates on that they came in quite a bit higher than what we had currently budgeted in our Ooh. hardscapes uh, 2018 budget um, Derek, Kara, and I met with BCA, talked about opportunities for bid alternates and uh, ways to reduce that scope. Um, it's likely we'll still have a project that's higher than uh, what we had currently estimated in the 2018, currently slotted down for that. Um, but our schedule is looking good. We're, our goal is to have it open before uh, Jetty Roads Day, and that's still looking like we're tracking well with that. Uh, ITEP, we met with our project engineers, Fair Graham, uh, went over a very preliminary path layout, discussed um, complicated areas. Um, we have an official kickoff meeting January 29th. Um, this will include CARL, MTD, uh, City of Urbana, and uh, IDOT, hopefully. So, um, as part of that process, we're going to have to do a uh, um, intergovernmental agreement with the city. This is for some right of way that's city um, that's within par a portion of this uh, path on the western side of Park Street. So we'll likely have to have that in the next month or so. We'll find out more soon after that kickoff meeting. On the west side of Park Street? Yeah, on that western, basically from the main entry to that's the corner central. of church. It, the main entrance at Central Drive, so ah, east would gotcha. be that, okay. and west it's, would yep. be on the other side okay. of that. Yeah, the current boundary is showing that it actually slips into what we would say is our park there, so we'll all have to have uh, an agreement with the city to proceed with that work. Whereas east of Central, it appears we own half of Park Street. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> as long as we don't have to do the repairs, that's okay. <laughs> that's odd. Uh, last thing I want to mention is that staff's currently working through a um, program statement for the athletics and wellness facility. Our Ooh, committee wow. will be reconvening, I believe, in two weeks, two and a half weeks, and we'll have a final draft ready for um, 
Farnsworth MTD group as needed for that potential facility in downtown Urbana. And uh, with that, we'll also be reviewing, <coughs> our committee there will also be reviewing those outdoor athletic field sites. So that's all I have for this meeting, unless there's any questions. I might just mention that uh, we're gonna, on Thursday morning at state conference, be joining NCAP to tour some, NCAP's the same group that did the um, bioswales at, at the University oh. Nature Center to tour some Lake Abri project, projects they've done up in the Chicago land area and, uh, and see if there's uh, any, any tricks to trade that they want to share with us to help to further sharpen our pencil. Good. I, since I'm, I'm going to the meeting um, and I'm going to be um, window shopping, so to speak, is there anything particular you think I should look at, look for? It's so, there's so much stuff mm -hmm. there that I mean, you could, I could spend the whole time downstairs looking at yeah. scoreboards. Yeah. Anything in particular you'd like me to pay attention to? Well, with, with, with Crystal Lake, uh, it seems like there's always uh, new environmental restoration contractors, and if there's ones that have a specialty in, in aquatic environments, we'd, we'd love to make them aware of our project. Okay. Um, water quality as well. Uh, we, we're still working on water quality and um, playground. There's playgrounds are always coming. We've got Phillips coming up. So yes, any yes, exciting yes, yeah. playground equipment would be, would be very welcome. Um, and including, you know, not for teen playgrounds as well, because soon after okay. our next playground, we'll be looking into Blair and that we're kind of in our heads gearing that up towards a more active, probably older group. Okay. So we'll be okay. interested to see some of that kind of stuff. Teen, no. teen playgrounds, right. teen mm -hmm. equipment. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of emerging. There's out there. Be curious to see what's at the show too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know Tim's going to talk a little bit about strategic planning in his report, um, but in terms of sessions, we're very interested in strategic planning mm -hmm. sessions. Okay. Yeah. So we should. Mm -hmm. I won't be there till Friday at before lunch, mm. but uh, maybe we could. Now that I think about it, maybe we should coordinate mm -hmm. so that we've got more things covered. Do you do you feel? Um, will we have people? How many are going? There's about 14 of us. Oh, okay. So then most then most things ought to be ought to be covered. Yes, okay. as far as all the areas. Um, but certainly at dinner we could touch base and see who went to what and figure our Saturday. Right, right. Or out. I can just kind of look and see yep. ahead of time on to see what's what's there. Um, is Matt? Is does Matt go? I'm not sure if he's going to go. He, I didn't believe he, he was going this year. Okay. He told me tonight he wasn't. Yeah, wasn't he? he wasn't. I think okay. I asked him last month. He was thinking about it, but wasn't sure of his schedule. So okay. I think, thought it looked unlikely, but. <laughs> I'll bring extra knitting and go to the legal sessions. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You'll have to see if, what is there, Carrie Kraft Hafer, whatever her name is, still is still, is still doing stuff. Oh, good, thanks. Okay, so I will set this aside so I don't lose it. We're almost done. Is that, that it for mm -hmm. the project? Great, thank you. So uh, moving right along to the executive mm -hmm. director's Great. report. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure we thank all the UPD staff over the last uh, maybe two weeks. Everyone's been working very hard in the cold, trying to keep the parks, facilities, customers, programs, everybody going. Really appreciate that. Um, I think our plans are set for the IPD IPRA conference. I think we just mentioned we have a group going about 14 of us. Um, Kelsey will be sending out information for the dinner plan, but we'll all have mm -hmm. a dinner operation <coughs> on Friday evening, per usual, around 7 o'clock. Um, also wanted to give a thanks to the customer service and the technology matrix. They're always working with customer input. Obviously, we occasionally have some technological challenges. We'll have a little update on that tonight, mm -hmm. but I know they're uh, very earnest at working with the, what they have and trying to work out a lot of those customer related issues. I did want to mention uh, a little bit more in detail, a strategic plan. 
obviously in 2018, we're going to gear up to uh, refresh and, and create a new plan for us. Um, just a little background, you know, staff's been working over the really the last two years talking with other park districts, who's doing really good planning, what firms are out there, are there what are the new trends? And so we read a lot of articles, talk with people, visit with people. Today we met with the Champaign Park District staff. They have, I think they're a little bit ahead of us. They plan to be done, I think, in May of 2018 with their plan. They've done it in a little bit different order. They've done some different reports and pulled some things together. They're kind of a little bit different framework. But, but really the takeaway is at least our staff has not identified any professional groups that we think are the go-to groups or the ideal. There are many groups, many architects, planners, you know, uh, landscape architects that, you know, could do the planning, probably have done planning. I think what we found and I think what Champaign found and what we hear other groups finding too is they're at least we're thinking of relying on our own staff. We think we could save money. You know, we spent quite a bit of money last time. We did really two things, a strategic plan, a community assessment or a mm -hmm. survey, and then we updated Crystal Lake Park plan, which was a separate uh, component. But nonetheless, we spent quite a bit of money. So one of our goals is can we do an in-house plan where we sort of farm out or bring in the expertise when and where we need it? We tend to do a lot of the work, make the recommendations, get things pulled together. And so I think we're feeling just as confident as Champaign Park District and let's lead this process. Kara Dudek will be our principal planner um, that will lead that um, from a staff perspective. But essentially what we, we want to do is put together a, um, a framework, basically the process. One of the steps we should probably do is I'd recommend a leadership and board retreat perhaps this spring where we could get together and kind of go over the history, talk about our old plans, what are we doing, what trends, what are we seeing, you know, emerging now, probably talk a little about our, what I'd call our, some of the structures that hold us tight, like our financing and staffing and facilities, but kind of do, you know, just a little background. Um, one person we have talked to and met with, Corky and Derek and I had met with uh, Jared Scheinemann, who recently left the University of Illinois from the Office of uh, Recreation Park Resources. He now has his own planning consulting group. He's basically taking taken all of his work and analysis he did through that department at the U of I and is now going out on his own. So we've met. Um, he's d been doing some planning um, exercises for a lot of communities, you know, as his role there. We thought it might be a good idea to invite him to come and join us for that retreat, have him maybe tell us a little more what's been going on from the university and their planning arm um, and talk about contemporary issues or new trends, you know, we can learn from that. Um, but basically after that, probably pull together our framework, which would outline our process and then start to launch that, find out what resources we need to have in place, what work we need to get help with, like if we decide to do a needs assessment or a community survey or some tool like that. Remember last year, we, or last time we worked with Leisure Concepts and had a separate community survey. Um, the reason we went with Ron Vine at that time was obviously had a lot of expertise, he still does. He's on his own now, he has his own smaller firm. Um, so he still does that kind of work. Um, but I think the things that staff sort of reflected on that we didn't really like is that's still a sort of a set pattern, set number of questions. One of the benchmarking aspects that they do offer is, you know, the first 20 or so questions can then be compared to other communities. Right. But we were reflecting, at least the UPD group has never gone back and done any other comparisons. So even though that information's out there, I'm sure if we called Ron up and said, hey, could you do a comparison of us and, you know, whatever community, he could do that. But the, the reality of that value just didn't realize <coughs> itself. So we felt that, yes, while we structured that portion of the, you know, survey and that part of the strategic plan, with that intent, it never really helped us in, in essence. You know, maybe it's our fault. We got so focused on the implementation. We didn't go back and do those qualitative analysis through that process. Um, but there may be a, a way or need to, you know, connect in a formal way with the community. But where we see more value is spending time with the community, um, being out at the parks, probably more similar to what we did with our Crystal Lake pool, where we tried to, our goal was to get as much input as we possibly could. So often the survey tools aren't really, I believe, as effective in reaching underserved or some of the issues that we've been talking about. If there's language or cultural barriers, 
Um, you know, it's great if you get the language, but if you have issues. So we want to kind of go beyond that. Um, but those are the things that we hope to explore and talk with you all a little more at the, um, at the retreat. The goal would be to get it going this spring, set some sort of defined timetable, a schedule, and, and then work through that. Um, I think some parameters we've already identified and talked with you about is maybe a little more shorter focus. There's probably, because we tend to work in capital cycles and look at our resources that sort of drive us, maybe we link our, our planning to that. Certainly there's opportunities to keep long range vision, you know, in, in that focus. Um, but again, I think when I looked back at some of the older park master plans, a lot of it was the long term recommendations and then who and how do you really start working on those? I think what you tend to do is get to a point where we have to redo our plan and those vision things, you know, they're still out there and they may be ingrained in the staff and the board and UPDAC, but if they're not, they tend to fall off. Mm -hmm. And so again, we're trying to get a good value, get the right size, the sweet spot that will meet our needs. Um, and more importantly, be very accessibly readable, readily accessible to our community. So if somebody said, well, what's the plan? We should have a, one, two, three, four, you know, a short message that we can all articulate and have documents that reflect that. So again, I think more graphics, shorter time frames, uh, more to the point looking at resources and evaluating all the aspects in our community. That's sort of the overview. Um, we, we're learning there's, you know, different words, you know, some groups are going back to a more comprehensive plan. In fact, I think the distinguished agency requires that or that's what they call and so, <laughs> You know, we're not following that track and so I think what we're suggesting is we want to customize our own plan and we think yep. we can do a good job and listen to people and s sort of keep it real too because there's only so much dollar that can be available and we have to rely on what we have to work with while still having exciting plans and visions you know for the future it takes dollars to do the exciting plans it does <laughs> exactly so. and that's a very good point we would rather recycle our resources to more necessary right. type task instead of you know you know strategic plans that may have may have a they're definitely needed they're required um they have a purpose but they may not value out the way we think of of our resources you know we we spend things three or four times and get the the value out of it and i'm not so sure some of the planning processes give you that so again we'll get our chance to learn later and reflect on that activity um, down the road. You know, were we successful? Do we meet our targets? But really what we're trying to create is a more flexible document that you can sort of keep up with, you can adjust or check off and, you know, have regular updates with the board and UPDAC and sort of track your process. Now that's all very easy to say, but we haven't seen a lot of plans out there that allow you to do that. Um, and so, um, I think we'll learn a lot, but we're very excited about that. And I think the time is right. I, I was talking with Derek and Corky and Katie um, after one of our leadership meetings. And, you know, lately I've had a little bit of an unsettled feeling. And that feeling I've kind of decided is probably it's time to get back to our priorities so that we can easily articulate. So, for example, staff can easily talk about Crystal Lake Park or Weaver Park or the KRT or the proposed indoor athletic facility. But we're not able to really articulate it beyond our walls and so we, that's really one of our goals is can we take that message and get it out there and get more people in urbana and also listen i think listening to our community is really important still that's an old-fashioned thing but people still like to be listened to and have an opportunity to to have input so we see opportunities even if we use a survey type tool that's mailed out let's say we would still see focus groups or listening parties or neighborhood opportunities for people you know to connect you know, the last thing you want to hear is, well, we mailed out a survey. Well, I didn't get one. Can I give you a, my input? Well, mm -hmm. no, we have a scientific approach here. We only need 430 responses, and thanks for your interest. So <laughs> that's not our style. So that's kind of an overall synopsis. Did I leave any critical stuff out? I didn't know if you guys had any updates. Again, didn't want to go into a real lengthy discussion tonight. Certainly if there's thoughts the board has or comments you'd like to make now, that would be great. But be thinking about that, um, you know, what's important and what is what are our visions? And again, I tend to think more in our five year capital because our dollars and resource and our staffing, you know, tend to drive that. Now, there's still opportunities for foundation support, donor support, you know, to make other things happen in the district. But getting a good read on the community, having a good plan 
and having it a, you know easy and accessible I think is real critical Jim I guess I might just mention that you know what we're hearing you know, from from Jared and his work with the rest of the state and here locally with Champaign Park District is that there's sort of this interest in, in, in thinking about strategic planning in a whole new way and, and even you know in Champaign where they're going to be redoing a comp plan they want to think about that in new ways um, not not just a um, a, a data dump of, of, of inventory of, of, of everything that's out there, but rather really looking at where the trends are both within your district and within the field of park and recreation and trying to, to, to help plan, develop a, a roadmap for where you want to go. And then and then within that, having your, your, your direction, so you know, you, as a staff, as a board, as a community, you, you all see where you're going. It's very easy to communicate. Right, and, and I think ours is a different path from most. It so is, I agree with that. I, I think that there are, are, very, are, are a lot fewer park districts that have the emphasis mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. nature, if you will, as opposed to right. you know soccer fields every two feet. Mm -hmm. And so that I think that would, in, in some ways, kind of limit us to who we chose if we were to choose an, a consultant, because I think that you have to have somebody who's mm -hmm. not sort of in that groove of what everybody else is mm -hmm. is doing. I know the city of Galesburg is doing a recreation department mm -hmm. strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And so um, Tony still gave us their proposals that, that they received. And I think there were probably eight or 10. And honestly, none of them excited me. I didn't think any of them really, and I'm sure they're all fine for them, so I'm not being disrespectful, sure. but it, it looked fairly standard, you know? Right. And I think what we want to do is well, one advantage we have is an advisory committee. So we want to really take advantage of that, work with our advisory committee and you know, what's important, what are the issues, start to identify that, and then see it reflected in the plan. Right, right. So I think that's some of our thoughts. Yeah. Well, maybe we can have Comments. one summer of, of, of listening as opposed to neighborhood nights. We can kind of build them as listening, as a mm -hmm. sort of a listening tour and, we, and go I around to more than one. Going to be ready. I yep. think our goal and recommendation mm -hmm. is let's be ready for this summer. Again, yep. it could extend beyond yeah. that. We'll think of new things. Um, right. But yep. we basically want to get things pulled together to get it get it rolling for that yeah. purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean that's a that's a that's a great way because people are mm -hmm. they're interested in that. You get a, a much different demographic than you do. I would agree with that um, too. I mean, you get people from the area, but you also sure. get you know people from outside, and there's different lots drawn to different musical. Mm -hmm musical groups into different parks so that I think you, you get a, a, a much better cross-section than right. practically any place else right. that you would go. Now, will staff be prepared to, like, when you guys are out there, whether it's at an event or, um, I don't know, various functions that you might host, will staff be prepared to answer questions for people in the community about various related things that you guys are doing mm -hmm. and be, I mean, are they kept abreast about what's going on to where if someone off the street were to come up and ask a question, are they able to fully explain what's going on within the park district? Yeah, I, I think we have to be. I think that would be something we would want to plan for, like literally like an idea, have a station you know, mm -hmm. to encourage people to come up to get information. And it could be new information too. Start early in the summer, could have updated information. Um, but we know people like information. And if you have it and you're willing to share it, I think they'll, they'll take you up on it. Um, but I think I know what LaShawn is asking. We had a recent 25-year-old event um, in June last year where people didn't even know the context. So as we're working towards something like this, it's how far, there's, there's paper information, but then like if somebody asks you about it, how well educated uh, and at what it, level is that on my help? Interesting. At what, yeah. is it just the yeah. leadership team who has the talking points or what, what level down does it fil right. filter? Mm -hmm. That may take a little more effort, you know, like getting ready, every staff or layers of staff ready. Um, but yeah, I, th I understand the point. So we, we need to be able to educate at least to our management level of staff to where they can articulate what are the goals, what are the purposes, you know, what are we trying to achieve, um, and hopefully direct them to somebody that could give them more information. Mm -hmm. right. Is that something that would be um, a part of training as new hires come aboard, whether they're full-time or part-time or seasonal and they're working these events or participating in 
I don't know, different tours or working with various groups, would they be able to answer questions that come about and feel comfortable without even management or anyone from leadership being around? You know, if you're engaging and having conversations with other people, can they comfortably answer those questions? Mm -hmm. I would hope to say yes. I could probably say we didn't achieve that level in our last strategic plan. I think it was, you know, we took a very different approach. We had sort of this stakeholder group, mm -hmm. I'll call it a blue ribbon panel group that were hand selected out of the, and that's very standard. That's not an unusual approach, but it's so limited. You know, I think you only get a few voices that then that actually show up and will come to every of the meetings, all of them, mm -hmm. you know, to get the whole series in. So that, it's just, I think we've learned some different things, but information sharing and understanding that information we all have to understand or agree that that takes a lot of effort to get everybody on board and up you know educated up um an another way to look at it is if somebody would ask me hey how, do, how are your basketball boy teams of the i don't know i'm going to be probably looking at corky because i wouldn't necessarily know the articulation you know the best answer mm -hmm. you know for that individual but i hear what you're saying we've got to find a way to be able to share it and have it consistent mm -hmm. and like at least to a reasonable to, level. If someone were to ask, you know, what's the history of Strawberry Jam? Could, you know, someone who works at an event be able to, you know, comfortably answer questions? I think some could. I think what we have to understand is that there's layers of different staff working the events at all the time. Some are volunteers. The public doesn't necessarily know, you know, uh, let me just get it out there. If, if somebody were to just ask somebody at an event, hey, what's the... I'm not sure would be my answer if they could articulate. Depends on how they've been trained, how long with us, what their function or you know role is. You know, we're still departmental focused, so people in operations tend to think operationally, recreationally, and administratively. Um, but that would be a good goal. I think that would be a good stated goal. Can you have a reasonable expectation of staff training and understanding of at least this important strategic plan mm -hmm. um, with that staff? And I think that would be a good test. Is it a good plan? You know, if it's so confusing and hard to understand, probably the answer is no. Um, but if it's, yeah, I think I can explain the key parts. Mm -hmm. That's what, and then be able to direct somebody to the right resource after, whether it's a website or a person at the park district or the next meeting, hopefully. Hey, come on out to the next meeting. It's next Tuesday. We hope to see you there. You know, that level of invitational mm -hmm. participation. Good questions. Okay. Are there other thoughts or questions? Again, I think one of our goals in the next probably three months is pull this together and try to get ready and certainly work with the board on a date, you know, our better time. You know, is it you know, April, is it May, or, you know, is it March? I know everyone has busy schedules, and, and that's one of the things we'll have to factor in, too. When do you do strategic planning? Most groups say, oh, avoid summer because your staff's really busy, people travel, they're unavailable. Um, we don't really want to wait till fall. So I think, and then when we get to fall, there's a short window, and once you get November 1, then the holidays, it's, it's, you know, we've kind of all sort of joked about these evolving, especially in the academic community. You know, there are semester sort of parameters we, we respect. Um, but I think it may be put a plan together and take advantage of the windows of time that you have in the groups that are available. So, if, for example, our events happen in the summer mostly or fall right, right so right, there would right. be a good window mm -hmm. but maybe if you're trying to reconnect with neighborhood groups you try to schedule that for the fall maybe when they're back to schedule or more regular that's all i had Thank let me you. just quickly check my notes so i didn't leave any, anything out any other um, questions I, I did want to mention there is a reception tomorrow at noon at the phillips rec center uh, just for the artist that was involved oh, with the right. mural on class. So if you're free at noon, please stop by. You don't have to stay long. Say hello if you can. Everyone's invited. Yeah, Janet said all that. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the president's report. Um, upcoming meetings, February 6th, there is a study session. And a tentative topic on that is uh, UPD staffing. And on February 13, uh, annual recreational statistics report. I'll be looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Semi-annual review of our uh, status regarding strategic initiatives. And uh, as Andy was intimating, there uh, likely be some bid approvals uh, to deal with. 
Um, that's about all I have. Moving on to liaison reports, the, the finance study group did meet uh, last Friday, um, discussed some of these <laughs> These things that have been covered here tonight, including the strategic planning and, and some of the capital things. I think uh, one item I would like to emphasize that was shown there was what a fabulous job has been done starting to put together a, a, a program of things that can be done in Crystal Lake Park and trying to get some price tags to them and things that can actually be... And there's some uh, some very nice work that has been done in regards to that. I uh, want to congratulate all those who've, who've put a lot of effort into that. I think they'd be well positioned to be able to go to the public and say, you know, here are, here are some things that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can really contribute and help with. So I think that was really positive. And I guess uh, we also heard a little more detail of, of some of the ITEP challenges. Uh, <laughs> of which there are, are uh, numerous uh, in Crystal Lake Park, but that, that, that'll be interesting moving forward. Is there anything from the policy study group? Well, we did not meet, but we did review the, doc, uh, the ordinance that you're seeing on the uh, new business mm -hmm. agenda via email. Okay. That's all I have. And Urbana Parks Foundation, uh, did anything to report there, Lashana? I have not been there, um, and I haven't had anything out of the last meeting notes to even report to the board. Okay. And the UPDEC planning study group, is there anything uh, to report there? Uh, we met without you. Yeah. 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 Without you. Um, but I think we've already covered what we did there. It's, we've got the, we've got the next um, set of meetings scheduled through the end of the summer mm -hmm. so we're good to go thank you everybody yep okay moving on to old business actually there was none and uh then to new business <laughs> alex, is here. alex has been patiently <laughs> waiting for her turn <laughs> here just as alex is coming up um i think michael reached out today he had some questions on the policy but the short brief background and alex will tell us everything this is a mandated requirement that we have a policy. Uh, obviously, there's groups out there re recommending what sh should be in the policy. We followed the suit. We worked with Lorna Geiler on, on this, but we'll have Alex sort of walk us through it, tell sure. us more about it. Okay. Um, on November 16th, Governor Rauner signed Public Act 100-554 into law. Um, this amends the Illinois State Officials and Employee Ethics Act to require local government entities to adopt a sexual harassment policy by ordinance or resolution on or before January 15th um, of 2018. And uh, while most entities, including ours, um, already have a policy, there are new elements um, that are required that we need to um, update our policy with. And um, at minimum, the new policy has to have a prohibition on sexual harassment, details on how an individual can report an allegation of harassment, including options for making a confidential report um, to a supervisor, ethics officer, inspector general, or the Department of Human Rights. So they're really expanding the comprehensive nature of the required language. Um, a prohibition on retaliation for reporting sexual harassment allegations, including availability of whistleblower protections, and that was really important to include. Um, under the Ethics, Ethics Act, the Whistleblower Act, and the Illinois Human Rights Act. Um, and finally, the consequence of a violation of the prohibition on sexual harassment and um, really new um, was the actual consequences for knowingly making a false report. Um, so it's a really comprehensive uh -huh. policy. Um, IEPD kind of kicked off this process by hosting a webinar that was um, really helpful. You could ask live questions, and so there were um, a lot of park districts participating. And um, Lorna, as Tim said, has um, reviewed this and approved it. I know um, one question I think that um, Michael, you might have had was uh, um, the term municipality. 
at least from um, me too. my research so far, I th uh, Park District, and we'll continue looking into it and we'll change it if we need to, but is a municipality from... Right. But it's also a district. I mean, I... Right. Yeah, it seems so strange <laughs> to me. I, I, I yeah. talked to Kelsey about it as well because I, I thought yeah. if this was set up for cities and it just plugged it in, then, then yeah, this I was mean, that's what I. It looks that's like. What, yeah. It does. It does. Yeah. It feels know. like. Yeah, I right. couldn't. I couldn't understand why it wouldn't say park district is a. Uh -huh. or, yeah, or this was. Um, yeah, right, or whatever. I think group designed it was. for any self-governing body. Yeah. Um, so, you know, something unique about it is it's really not meant to just encompass your employees. It's meant to cover everyone um, that you know really comes in contact with. Um, an employee or really anyone in, in, in the park district realm, um, you know, stemming okay. from Springfield. So it's, it's kind of unique in that sense is that this policy isn't for just employees. It expands to pretty much everyone. But we'll look further into that. And, you know, if, if this was, you know, by omission, then we can change it. But if this is the required language, then we can, you know, right. proceed. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would just say, but my reading of it is it's, uh, it's so full of legalese. I mean, if you're if you're s somebody who is feeling aggrieved, mm -hmm. and you read this, right. are you gonna really believe that you can get any justice? I mean, <laughs> I, I, and I understand the, the lawyers all get involved. I, I'm just thinking that if if we revisit this a little bit, that it could be made a, a lot more in tune with what I think the general attitude of the district is mm -hmm. and how we treat people. Now, maybe not, but I, I, I'd, I'd be willing to put some effort myself into, <laughs> yeah, into our, trying to solve it. Our current policy dissolve. is that way. Pardon? Our current right. policy is that yeah, way. Yeah, it's but, much more um, sensible yeah. down to earth. And Michael, one thought we had was to, you know, we, we have had policies that are lengthy, a few, and then we tend to either develop a procedure, yeah. maybe there's a, yeah. even a flyer. We could develop that had yeah. the basics, you know, so if, you know, it was available, it was visible at the offices right. or something that might be a little, what I kind of anticipated understanding from you was, is it user friendly? Does what, can I get right, through this? Right. What, what do I really do if I have a situation? So there may be, a, you know, the policy and then there could be other tools right. we're right. open to. And yeah, because you, you, you don't want to have only the, the simple thing because that gives you too much, I mean, it gives lawyers to often too easy access so I mean if you I mean if you look at this as sort of a CYA and, and covering every papering over every crack and and just covering every contingency that you can think of but I think mm -hmm. Tim's idea of having something that the more sure. and that, that's simpler and more down-to-earth it doesn't have to be so full of legalese because you're absolutely right, right. and I mean I, I, I don't want to beat it on this horse, but it's not required that your statements be in legalese. They can be in straightforward, understandable by a layman English. That's yeah, that that perfectly lovely? allowable mm -hmm. and is still, but understand we've got to meet the law. We need to pass something. We need to have some here. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of other things bearing down on the staff to deal with, but I would like to see this uh, addressed more completely. And I'm willing even to participate with the policy committee or whatever to try to see if we can't come up with something that ultimately later on is a little more in tune with what I believe we, the district stands um, for. Kind of to not um, maybe release this as a, you know, a, a standalone policy that is might take people um, by surprise and not be understandable. We actually have a training scheduled for February 27th. Um, where we'll go through the usability, I guess, of the policy and maybe, you know, make a, you know, like a FAQ sheet or um, some sort of, you know, easy to digest procedural um, document, but we'll actually go through, um, you know, a general sexual harassment training and then um, go through the new policy. So hopefully that would make it a little more approachable um, and we can continue to work. I think the hesitation of, you know, making something more digestible for the manual is, you know, what if you've, you know, as Nancy was alluding to, created a loophole or, mm -hmm. you know, not covered your basis. So I think that's where, you know, caution is sometimes yeah, but useful. It's, but I'm with you. I'd be happy to sit down because I, I legally just makes my head hurt. And I think that it's, 
I think it's I don't think it's so terrible legalese, but maybe that's because I do this training every year for the University I, of Illinois. I, I, so I don't we're know. probably more tuned. I mean, I, I was going to say, uh, go ahead, Mary. You know, I mean, it, it. I don't see it as so terrible, but I mean. Oh no, I've read worse. <laughs> True, <laughs> but the thing that's changed is, is like you've had to implement some of the the language changes, right, within the already existing right. policy, correct? One thing I was going to point out the obvious, I'm sure many districts are probably having this discussion this month yeah. while they approve theirs and probably due to our own professional limitations when it comes to, you know, risk insurance or liability legally, right. we tend to rely on our, you know, paid experts. And I think we should. Well, and, and I'm just saying yes. we're, we're probably not real good at challenging that because I guess we see the slippery slope if you, you know, if you don't have it adequately, you know, covered. But in finding ways to make it easier or more transparent or easy, just easier to get your hands around, I think that's where we do excel because we anticipate what the public questions are and how they perceive our information. So I think that's something we could do. But you know, I assume when we talk with Matt and Lorna about <clears throat> developing policies, you know, they're they're giving ironclad information, if you will, um, and maybe their mindset isn't putting it into you know, the fourth grade level, you well, know, information level. So right. I think that's what I'm just suggesting. That's probably how we get in these situations. We rely on them to create it. We don't necessarily have the ability to amend it and stand up legally, right. you know, we're, we're right. confident. But and I so think you kind could of write a, a paragraph. I'm looking at just at the bottom of this, I don't know, maybe it's the third or third page. Pursuant to the Whistleblower Act. Really, I bet you could write, I, I mean, you could, encapsulate the idea of pursuant in a different way because I'm guessing that 75% of the population doesn't have a clue as to what pursuant means. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the kind of thing you're meaning, right? That's a, to a certain degree of it. And, and some of these things I looked at, the, the definitions were pretty darn big. And, and you know, <laughs> uh, how would anybody know if, if it applies to them or not? I, I, I just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, on page two, there are, um, I, this is something we didn't have in our old policy, was a pretty, the very top of page two is a pretty comprehensive list of um, true examples of, you know, what might constitute Correct. sexual yeah, harassment. Yeah, right. that was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that was at least um, a positive change. But, you know, to um, kind of elaborate this, you know, didn't come at the best time of year. We had um, a <laughs> lot going on, and um, we'd be happy to, you know, continue to, um, research this more and well, yeah I don't think we're in disagreement with the basic with the right. basic principle basic idea it's just of, of how it's right how it's worded is that well yeah lar largely that and I also understand this was done uh, under time pressure right uh, another unfunded mandate that's where I was gonna go <laughs> just yeah, please yeah. make sure we it get comes that down in, into yeah, the discussion the same time. get this done by yesterday whether the legislature said to do this or not uh, it's <laughs> an important issue right and yeah. it has big you know has Certainly. growing grown and, right. Uh, understood uh, right uh, and I think that added to the haste hastiness of getting something and so you know think of it from a there's 438 park districts in the state IAPD's primary goal is to give them tools and they probably had to yeah. develop it quickly yeah. and they understand there's everything from park districts with towns with 200 people up to you know you 20 million them. right yeah. and i would just hate to we've checked that box off correct we're done with that right right yeah i'm happy to have them i mean so i'm happy to pass it but i'm happy to have a better uh, right. uh, yeah. a exactly. closer look for clearer language i think it'd be wise for us to go back to our council share that with them what help can we get there um start breaking this down into compartments you know what what do we really need to share in a different way so there's uh, well how about if we look at it first that would be fine and then they can criticize well, well yeah. does that make sense to you uh, uh, yeah i've seen what else might actually be out there in the world or at least yeah identifying what the concern right yeah. where, yeah. right yeah. because there's no more point detail. paying them to go over things that, right. that for example if alex pointed out page two if that yeah we're not concerned about those definitions right. you know then what specifically would you know we ask them that would help them because i i think they would 
yeah, we can try that. What what specific? Sure. And there's yeah. no. I mean, it's it's hard to make corrections when you don't know what people are. Right. Or to make changes when you don't what, know what people right. are thinking needs to be changed, because then it's just a whole other set of things to. No, I think to just see. a comparative. You know, when we did our agreement with the uh, school district on the indoor aquatic center, I think one of our attempts was to try to get it in. So we did a few rounds. We had the leisure of you know working that document into a little more readability. Yeah, I think there were certain points that were legalese, and we were able to wrangle those out. Probably a little bit different type of a document. You know, that's an agreement mm -hmm. between two agencies and not necessarily with your wider public on a topic mm -hmm. like this. I think I'll just jump in, too, and add, I think when we get into the other goals and transgendered policies and training, mm -hmm. we're probably going to have similar experiences. One, because it's new, mm -hmm. so everybody's got to bolst bolster it up make sure they're protected, and then wade through all the nuances that you'll find in that. So I'm anticipating topics like these probably are just harder to, you know, make simpler just because of the level of concern and, and there'll or be, some of the newness. I, I foresee there being, there's the policy itself that uh, we've already done that. We've already included LGBT and um, transgender and all that language in our policy. The next steps will be more procedural right. on how things are handled internally and how external things will take place as well. So when you have customers and when you have employees. So that's more of an appendix section of the policy manual rather than the actual policy. So it's more procedural and it could be something, same thing Alex was saying on this policy. I think the staff assumption and recommendation would be, you know, we get this into place this evening and then continue to work. We can certainly work with the policy committee to update really any of our policies, but we just want to make sure we're doing it so they're legal, but then also yep. what do we need to do to bring some light to it. So we'll vote on it to meet the January 15th mm -hmm. deadline, then we'll look at it, revisit it, and create a separate supplement I, that's I, easier. That's I think easily. we would work with the board and the policy committee to meet whatever needs you all have. So, for example, I think this is legally accurate and it's a good policy. Yep. There's nothing wrong with this policy. It's what our council recommended and that is urging us to get into place tonight. However, we want to move from that, whether it's write our own policy, ask them to rewrite it, or create companion documents or FAQs or brochures that, you know, if you've been sexually threatened or, you know, you pull it off the shelf or you direct it to a staff, we can do all, all those things. I think, you know, our goal was first get this done because well, we're, we're going to be in well, trouble we, if we don't. We yeah, have absolutely. to. We, had, we, we had to. No, no doubt of that. And, and I, I don't, don't mean this as criticism of for what has happened. It's right. been limited time. Right. Uh, it, you got to make something happen in a hurry. And uh, I would just like to not see it fall by the wayside right is, yeah. is yep. the tick box and and right. we're done with it all over because that was my initial question like if they adopted it in november but then now we have to make a decision like we were shocked as yeah like right that. now yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's absurd yeah. i mean think <laughs> just another comparison think of the amount of time we discussed on drones and it's not even i'm going to say not as a serious of a threat or a concern as something of this nature so we didn't have a lot of, you know, exploratory time, but neither did all those other districts and cities either. Okay. All right. Is there someone who would like to make a motion that we uh, adopt Ordinance 2018-01? I move that we adopt Ordinance 2018-01, revised in Section 8.13 of the Urbana Park District Personnel Policy Manual. Second. That's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Uh, a roll call vote, and uh, this time starting to the right? Aye. 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 And that carries unanimously with uh, all four commissioners voting. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, Alex. thanks for your work. And uh, technology team update, <coughs> I think, is the next item here. We've got the, the crew here. Give us some updates on technology. Again, it's another evolving, wide, interesting, deep, 
intense uh, topic, but we thought it'd be best to get the staff that are actually working in the day to day and looking ahead at what's coming up next, kind of hear it and then be able to ask questions about that. Turn it over to you all. So, uh, Katie, Derek, and I got together and we're trying to do a synopsis of the last. Actually, I was thinking about tonight. It's actually been about eight years worth of work mm -hmm. um, that we've been putting uh, little baby steps into improving our technology. Um, but then when we started making the list, I felt pretty good because we've done a lot of things just for the staff capabilities that we have. Um, so I, I believe it might even started, Tim and I may have been doing a little bit of this in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's expanded with the help of Derek when he was the project manager. And then um, a couple years in, one year in, we started uh, thinking, well, we really need to include people from every office and, and get all the input so that when we do do new things, everybody, there's somebody who knows the whole knows what's going on. Um, so we put together a team. Um, the names there are on the uh, back side of the first page. Um, so that, that represents all of our facilities. Um, and we want to take a few minutes just to kind of walk through um, what we've accomplished, some challenges that we have, and um, things that we're working on as uh, as we speak and moving forward. Um, so starting out with some of the accomplishments, um, we used to have the uh, dial-up dial internet. <laughs> um, you know, and, and it seems like, well, you just, okay, now you've got uh, UC2B and it's all there and it's done and it's set up. Well, that, that was quite the project all on its own, trying to do the transition um, with that. But now we've, we've got, uh, you, the cable fiber, um, it's ITV3 now that um, basically owns those lines and, and sells them to us for um, a monthly rate at, e at each facility. Um, then we got into the active net. Um, actually, the AppleTrack online was, was first. Um, that's where, you know, we went from you have to come in fill out an application. We're sending hundreds of applications around to each office. Mm -hmm. um, so we're finally- through this. We, it's bringing we, back <laughs> memories, right? The, they'd come into the Phillips, you'd make a copy and send it to wherever they're applying for, um, which not only um, is a lot of work, it's also passing people's information mm -hmm. in a way you don't want to be passing information. Mm -hmm. um, so we started the AppleTrack, there was a couple, I was actually at a conference one year, I, I seen um, NeoGov and I seen AppleTrack. NeoGov was a company um, that Champaign Park District was actually using and it was a very expensive um, system. Um, but we were really looking, what we need to do something. And we actually came across this AppleTrack company, which at the time the Urbana School District was using that um, program and that company. Um, since then, now Champaign Park District is also using that, which it is a good thing when you're thinking of summer employees. Um, you know, my son could fill out an application for Urbana, and then he could go in, and his most of his information is still there. He just picks the job that he wants if they're using the AppleTrack mm -hmm. program. So. Um, it's easier for our part-timers and our full-timers to apply. But um, So then we had the Apple Track. Then um, shortly after that, we started working on um, online registration. As we know, that was, uh, as Katie can attest to as well with, this, with yeah. the, the accounting software, it's not a quick, this is what we want. There's a lot of... Um, getting demonstrations, talking to people who are using these different companies. There was, um, there's more than one. Um, and so we settled on app, on the uh, active net. Um, but anyhow, we've, we've got the online registration we had to work through. Um, still not perfect, but it, it's a lot better than what, um, 
we had and it's a lot better than where it was when we first started so um, next now that we had the fiber we could upgrade our telephones mm -hmm. um, so there was not only <coughs> upgrading the telephones and facilities which are expensive so you, we didn't do all that at one time we would do a facility by facility um, which updated our there's several upgrades in this process so it upgraded um, your on hold messages and your um, phone capabilities but then just a few years ago we made our made hub here at Kerr so now when we leave on hold messages we could do it at one, one site and instead of marketing going to each site and mm -hmm. setting um, it also has um, efficiencies in the fact that if I need to talk to Tim, which I do quite regularly, I hit his three-digit number and I go straight to him rather than calling, talking to Kelsey or Katie or Karen or mm -hmm. whoever's there at the cottage, and then they've got to, they go straight to him. So we've made some vast improvements along those lines. Um, also with that, um, when you go to just recently, last year and a half, we now have a emergency line um, that we can post on our um, rental reservation signs. So if somebody rents the lake house, they dial a number and that number is gonna send them actually to Janet's cell phone. So we found that out the hard way. We had somebody who was impatient mm -hmm. at getting in they weren't supposed to be in yet but they wanted in which oh, yeah. lots of people want to get in there as soon as they can but we hadn't unlocked the facility yet because it was still early compared to when they were supposed to be there um, and they had no way of contacting anybody so through our upgraded phone system we're able to post a number that isn't Janet's cell phone but it is a number where they call and it goes to the person that can help them not me that don't even know who's reserving that today. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one upgrade that, that was able to happen. The tree inventory, you wanna talk a little bit about the tree inventory? Sure, you all may remember that we inventoried all of our freestanding park trees uh, using the, the Davy Tree Keeper system in partnership with the city of Urbana. Um, it also gave us uh, a much more comprehensive way of addressing our pruning of, of hazard trees and two inch plus deadwood. Uh, we're now moving into the, the smaller tree pruning cycle. So it's really helped us be much more sophisticated in how, how we take care of our trees. Uh, all of our new trees are, are mapped and we can track our watering for them very easily, produce maps for our watering staff. And uh, additionally, all of our tribute memorial trees, we have a permanent record of where they're located along with information about those trees. So just a wonderful system that we're, we're really excited about. Just a quick comparison. In 1987, I did the city of Urbana's tree inventory walked around every street in Urbana with a clipboard, measured by hand. <laughs> that took about four months, and then I spent the next year inputting all the information. And what it really just gave us was a database of tree by address, location, condition, and remarks. So if you can just in that relative short time, 12,000 trees touched, hugged every one of them. Hey, Phil, compared what to what you're doing to my tree. People are able to do oh, update it God. in the field, and it's already <laughs> in our, our site with new and current information and all kinds of notes and pictures and things you can add to it. It's constantly being updated. Yeah, well, that, that I was going to ask uh, what is the, 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 the maintenance time for <laughs> keeping it up to date? There are a lot of trees that aren't there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Rich has done a wonderful job with his staff of keeping up to date. Um, and you know, we initially thought they'd use a pad, go out in the field to, to do updates, but what, what they find themselves doing is just coming back to the office and making updates on a regular basis. So it's, it's all current. Hmm. So then moving on, um, you know, I, it's about four years ago, we updated the UPD website Believe it or not, we'll be looking at needing to do some updating again in uh, the oh, next I it. In, in 19. Um, again, we just had to do, yeah, and I'm not the right one for terminology here, but we had to do some updating on our site to make it uh, more secure um, to, to users. Um, so that was an update that we just did recently. 
um, b before Dana has had moved on. Um, there's a lot of that came about one we just had a pretty old system and two there's also some ADA standards that needed to be met um, keeping up with um, technology in general is why we need to look at it again after about five years is is the life of it without update it doesn't mean it needs to be completely brand new but uh, definitely um, be looking at what we need to do in the future to update it. Um, we were ended up with some messaging boards. Um, one, the big uh, message board outside of Phillips. Um, then we also have a message board now through uh, Bright Signs, which is uh, in inside Phillips, still dealing with some, it's probably more of an issue, but I didn't bring it up in the issues, but um, bright sign the way it, it speaks um, wants to use um, it wants to go through our network but it can't go through our network so you know we're working around that challenge um, so we've had a little bit of challenge on um, keeping the Phillips board up to date we did get it in good shape inside um, for the summer however we're waiting for Wi-Fi which will be something we talk about and down the road where we don't have to go through the city system we can go through the wi-fi and then we can it'll be uh, a lot smoother and mm -hmm. uh, better for um, updating so we've got also have one at the outdoor pool so you know in eight years we've ended up getting a nice big message board outside a couple new uh, signs inside the facilities um, has really broadened how we can get our message across about what's going on and uh, cross-promoting mm -hmm. uh, programs at different facilities. I can speak about the next one. Okay. Um, not so long ago, maybe even just a year ago, um, we did not have automatic backups on our computers. We had buttons on our computers that each individual user on each individual computer had to click in order to back up their documents. And you had to remember to click it and you had to click it regularly. Show of hands, who was doing no. that? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and not only that. Who got burned? I need a prompt. <laughs> not only that, but um, if you did back up your computer, it was backing up to the server that was in your own office. So if there really had been a catastrophic event in your office, um, I don't We're know, a fire. Flooding. There was flooding. Flooding? Then, flooding? Then there was no that. way to recover that like information both. from that lo oh. location. So um, not only do we um, now have all of our backups happening on our individual computers automatically, but they're backing up to the internal server computer, but that is also backing up automatically to the city every night. So we have offsite automatic backups, which is like very standard, but it was very Huge. difficult mm -hmm. to get um, mm -hmm. in place and surprising that it took us this long. But it's it's a big I think a big accomplishment that keeps us more secure and much easier now to recover lost data so is there any backup from that stuff yes they they back the the, the servers the up county. to disk and they take every take every week or something they take them off site and they have like eight rotating ones and they keep them and they rotate them in so yes um do you want to talk about the cyber security too the Oh, Alex sure. Moved. Alex was really, would really be best, but Sanford recommended that we do a cyber security training, which is basically don't click on the link um, to any email that you get. Don't click on the link. And um, Sanford had really asked that we train all of our staff in cyber security. And so we contracted with a vendor called Know Before. And we had staff, we did two different rounds of trainings, uh, one when we first started it, and then one right before our contract expired, we had like an annual one-year contract. So we were able to get kind of two big, big trainings out of the one, and we just did, we just wrapped that up last month. But throughout the time that we did it, the way that the training, it has you do, um, it has you send out spoof emails to your staff and see who clicks. <laughs> you, don't, you don't call them out. Gotcha. But it gives you a baseline for kind of the problem you have. Right. And then you do the training, and then you do the assessment again. And we went from, I don't know, a good percentage of clicks to no clicks. 
So it really was effective. The training was really effective, and we were pleased that we did it. And I think yeah, and that we scared it, everyone into not there, clicking on things. Follow up yes, a year later. it did. And then we, we followed up again. Phone. Yeah. <laughs> we just did our second one. Yeah. We just did it. I can't believe you asked such a such a question. <laughs> Unless I was picked down because I clicked before. I know I did a second one. Well, nobody picked on anyone. We don't have to confess here. <laughs> But it was really to the point even, I mean, it was very effective because one of the spoof emails was sent to one of our staff and he printed it out and took it to the police. But it was our, <laughs> because he was that concerned about this person that was emailing him. <laughs> the, the claim was that there were police saw him speeding down University <laughs> Avenue. And he was yeah, I mean, the email was so specific. It said like, we saw you speeding down University Avenue. Click here to see yourself on video. You know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, You're not supposed me. to click it. But it was very specific, you know. And so these, <laughs> and that's what they're saying is these cyber criminals are getting mm -hmm. to be very cunning. Much so, more sophisticated. Um, <laughs> anyway, it was effective. And I, I think we're interested in continuing doing career. some sort of cybersecurity trainings, but there's a lot of vendors that do it, and we weren't necessarily married to know before for any reason. So we thought we might see what else is out there for future. I found it very useful just in my personal life because I'm getting more and more Me too. Home, and I'm, yeah. I'm now sharing yeah. them with my wife. Yeah. yeah, I found it helpful too. Yeah, and the contract allowed us to, um, you could share the links and the trainings with your family members. <laughs> just to click on them. <laughs> yeah, so it was really a great resource mm -hmm. for us when we did that training. I'll talk a little bit about alternate IT consultant. You all are familiar <laughs> that we brought on MCS. Uh, they're doing all of our IT that's not our city network, <clears throat> you know, not our, our desktop PCs that are on uh, what we call G, which is the city network. The city was seeing that we were expanding more and more in other IT areas, whether it be building automation systems or uh, Wi-Fi, the messaging boards. Uh, and it was really, um, they, they, they were helping us as they could, but it was challenging for them to keep up with all that on top of what they're doing. And, and, and truthfully, they're seeing the same challenge in their own uh, agency, uh, that they're seeing more and more need for these same sort of platforms and it's, it's, we're actually noticing uh, on our end that, that they have limited capacity to, to do things like computer replacements. And so uh, we brought on uh, MCS uh, to, as our IT consultant. They've been very helpful. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of the success we had with the automatic backups was because of MCS, mm -hmm. helping us yeah. to kind of work through some thinking with the city in terms of how best to, to do that. Uh, they've had a couple different instances where they've helped with Wi-Fi, existing Wi-Fi out at the Nature Center in the pool. Uh, and uh, they're very eager to, to take us to the next step. And so we've been waiting uh, on I-3 uh, to bring fiber, a new fiber line to UIAC, and we got an email today that, that they did made a splice, and so it, it's, <gasps> it's imminent. Uh, once we have that done and I-3 updates all of our agreements uh, for five years, uh, which is what our, 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 our new agreements will be for uh, our bandwidth, uh, MCS is poised to come in and very quickly move move Wi-Fi in. In fact, they think they can do it within within weeks. So oh, they're uh, dancing with glee over there. Let me tell you. Yeah. So that's great. Yep. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on some of those. Um, we we have uh, the tech team, and I think I got to give Nicole the most credit for this. She has gone through and put together an inventory of all of our. Um, computers and AV equipment um, and with dates, codes, where each one is. Um, oh, cool. Copiers. Copiers. Not just computers, but, yeah. you know, our servers, our other yeah. other technology equipment. So we, we've got a list now and, and everything's dated. And um, we continually, the plan is to continually look at that list and, and upgrade as needed before something goes bad. Um, you know, Sean has always told us and Sanford that computers have more of a five five year they have a five year warranty, but that's really kind of the window on them. Now I don't think that's the case for every computer we have because there's some stations that we may not need to worry as much um, if we're within that scale and we're really taking that approach um, with like for example the work lab room, computer room in this facility that where somebody's not constantly working on it. Email, internet, you know, word processing, yeah. but not they're not doing GIS or AutoCAD type work. Mm, right. Um, so now we have the, our list. We're working down that list. Um, we did a year ago. 
We ordered uh, 20 computers, which will mm. take the place of um, basically all the hand-me-down computers from the city. Um, so this will put us pretty close to owning all of our computers, which eight years ago we maybe had two or three. Um, and we're better than that even before we start replacing them. We, we probably had 12 or 13 computers in the district that were owned by the park district. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we were getting the computers after they were done with their warranty and after, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, which is big for um, a lot of, you know, a lot of things, but, you know, as we were trying to find out there for years why the systems were slow, some of it was due to the, the equipment we, we were using. Mm -hmm. um, lots of other factors, but that, that's also part of it. Um, so I feel good about the fact of where we're at with that. Um, the aquatic facility connectivity, um, Derek just mentioned that we now are going to have our own line going in there. Um, a lot of the challenges with, with that facility, um, it is a it comes off the school district, um, which goes to the city. So now we have the school district who is careful what we put or what goes through the, the line. We've got the city that's worried about what goes through the line. So as you want to connect uh, building automation systems and you want to connect the new pool pack or the strantral units or, um, yeah. you know, iCloud, um, or not iCloud, the, the cloud um, for um, different uh, programs. Uh, they have issues with, with a lot of that, so we have to work through all those challenges. And there are ways, but that's more equipment. Um, this way with our own separate line, and speaking of the Wi-Fi, we could take Wi-Fi off of that. We can take um, the alpha control system. We can take... All those kinds of systems now we can can use them to be more efficient in what we do. With that said, we have found some workarounds, but um, it's not ideal. Um, public facility Wi-Fi. I wanted to touch base on that real quick when when Derek was mentioning um, Wi-Fi. Yes, we do have the residential Wi-Fi at pretty much all of our facilities. Um, that's the one you get at home when you get the ITV3 or UC2B it was when it came to your house. Um, but ultimately what we want, this facility has public Wi-Fi. Um, the outdoor pool has the public Wi-Fi set up to be on its own. And that's what our ultimate goal is at, at all of our facilities that um, the public uses. So when they come in um, for a presentation at the lake house, they don't need to ask the, the attendant, what's your access code, which it's not as effective either. It's pretty weak. So this, a lot of our facilities will even have a direct line mm -hmm. into our, our Wi-Fi uh, line. So um, it's been a long process, but we're finally getting there. I'll be excited when we, we get that done. Then we've got the accounting software that Katie's working on with the tech team. I'm going. Just, I just got back from uh, winter vacation with the kids today, and I firmed up a full day on site demo with one of the vendors that we're interested in. So that's happening on January 25th. So that process is slower than I hoped it would be. I was ready to release some um, a bid basically back in April and was kind of put on hold um, to do more background research and to kind of change the way we were doing the process at that time and and to be honest because it got put on hold in april i couldn't even pick it back up again until september when the audit was over so it was really just a huge delay in the process that i couldn't do anything about and um but i'm really excited we're we've done three um web demos with three different vendors and like i said they're ha they're coming on site in just a couple weeks and we're going to get a more in-depth look at one of the vendors um here really soon so hoping to move forward as best we can in that process very soon so and are you looking at cloud-based systems versus running 
Yeah, the two vendors that we are most impressed with of the three, one of them is server-based only, and the other one is both. You could either do cloud-based or server-based. We are more interested in cloud-based at, at this point, so that's the vendor that we're, we're previewing um, on the 25th. And then there's a continuing of uh, just ongoing software maintenance and upgrades and working with uh, the city on um, making those happen, mm -hmm. um, which sometimes is a challenge. Uh, we're working on, you know, we, we had a class that was working on uh, some park tour apps, sculpture garden apps. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of fell through, but we're, we're picked it back, we've recently picked it back up. We have some staff here, Kayla. Yeah, Kayla and, and Kara, Kara are both uh, proficient in GIS and have done some training on app development and uh, it's uh, That's good. Yeah, they've, they've already created a couple and they're eager to, to do more. Cool. We're working to find, um, we had a guy from the University of Illinois that came in talking about some different apps that you could use with GIS mapping, um, like in our parks. So, you know, when we're looking to um, find out what our park users, where they're from, you know, what they like about the park district, what they'd like to see about the park district, these could be an app that we could use right there in the park, plug it in to a, a, a notebook of some sort and um, be able to have that mapped out on our GIS just like we can do with our people who register for our programs. So oh, those are good. some of the things that we're looking for to in the future. Um, again, I mentioned earlier, the website update. I know Derek has talked a lot about um, maintenance management software. Um, I, you can speak on. Sure, yeah, well, so, so you know, it, it, its simplest form of maintenance management system is a way of tracking um, what you do, where you do it, and then perhaps, you know, if you use any equipment doing it. What we have been doing forever is, is using Excel and or um, um, access to, to, to keep you know, records of that. Um, but they now have software where when you plug that material in, you can do much more sophisticated analysis and queries uh, looking at, at parks. And what we're hopeful is that this can tie in with our new financial system so that when I want to find out what our annual billing for the Weaver Park Basin is, I don't need to call up Katie and her staff to have a, a, a rather mm. um, you know, Lengthy. basic report process that, that, that really isn't that, 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 that functional and rather I can, I can really do this analysis on a more regular basis and that's just one example but it can be done throughout the parks and so we're very excited about that. And then to speak also about the time and attendance software so none of the accounting software programs that we've seen so far including the pretty luxurious system that the city chose they don't actually do time in, time out attendance. Um, the basic capability just allows you to say, this staff person worked eight hours this day, eight hours this day, eight hours this day. But they don't let you say you came in at eight, took a lunch from noon to one, and then left at five, which is really how we do it now on paper timesheets. So the next kind of realm as a future goal after we get accounting software situated would be to start looking into a more sophisticated electronic time and attendance system. Right now we are using a web-based system for our part-time staff and the majority of our part-time staff are using that, at least in the rec department. Um, and it's called Humanity by, and it's, it was called Shift Planning, but it got bought <laughs> out by a company called Humanity. So, um, and it's working just fine for part-timers. Um, we tried a trial with full-time staff and it didn't work as well. So we think that we need a bit more sophistication when it comes to time and attendance for our full-time scenarios, uh, which is why we would wanna look into something. Now, the vendors that we work with, they typically have time and attendance systems that are compatible with their accounting programs. And so we'd probably start there and, and see what we could do. But either way, we should be able to find some sort of bridge of an import into the accounting system accounting system once the time and attendance software is selected. Well, and I can say the humanity that uh, Katie mentioned has made a world of difference oh, yeah. for our part-time staff. It's great. Um, huh. You know, we, we started this when we opened the outdoor pool because we had a lot more aquatic staff. And uh, 
if we ever had any issues with timing, it was usually with aquatic staff. So this is a, 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 a pretty good system that also allows you to send out messages. Um, so okay. so Leslie and, and Jennifer can send out, or shift managers as well, can send out schedule changes or schedule needs or those kinds of things. So it's it's been very nice to have. Um, analysis of user data, again, as we talk about some of these ongoing things, the apps and um, the GIS mapping, how do we use that data as we get it? Um, even looking more at our online registration system and, and analyzing that even farther than what we're doing so far. So we will continue to look at that. Um, uh, I'm supposed to speak about the technology spending slide, but before I dive into it, the very first line that's darkened is not supposed to be a header. It's actually just another line within this chart. So it was a, uh, okay. there's a formatting error is what I'm saying. Um, so this it, total right here is just kind of a one year glimpse at our technology spending. So we currently have two capital years that are open that have technology funds available. We have 20,000, a budget of 20,000 in the 2017 capital budget, and we have a budget of 10,000 in the 2018 capital budget. And then all the remaining lines in this chart are all in the operating budgets. Um, so we pay accounting services to the city of Urbana of approximately 15,000, a budget of 15,000. Um, we pay for in information technology services, which is a combination of the city and MCS spending. Oh. The city is about 37,000 of that, and MCS is the rest. Um, we also pay for copier, printer, and maintenance contracts for our copiers and printers of about 5,000. We have other software maintenance fees. That would be things like Microsoft Office, um, our uh, antivirus software, et cetera those kind or also um, uh, Adobe and other software packages that we have on our computers that we are required to keep licenses and maintenance for um, we have a budget of 20,000 a year for that and then I have right, budgeted right now 165,000 for the purchase of accounting software that won't be spent I don't believe in um, FY 18 so we'll probably see a similar budget number up here in the FY 19 budget depending on the timing and the status of where we are with that project um, some of these are recurring costs and some of them are capital costs. Right, yeah. Uh, so I tried to label them as such. Uh, go ahead, do you have a well, question? Well, no, I'm just curious. I mean, the, the, I mean the, the, the elephant in the room is the accounting software mm. purchase, and at the same time, I assume that's going to have recurring costs. It will, and I've actually received quotes from all three of the vendors that we previewed, and the $165,000 is right, I think it was pretty accurate, maybe even a little high in the budget realm, and the ongoing costs are actually lower um, in the quotes that we've received than what we're paying to the city of Urbana for accounting services. So I actually expect the ongoing maintenance cost for the system to go down once we've fully implemented. But I think the upfront one-time costs for implementation won't exceed the 165 budget, and that'll just be a one-time cost. It was really good news when I opened those quotes. I was like, yay. So while we, we feel good about the things that we've been able to accomplish, um, we also have challenges. That's why um, some of those things take a while to actually get done. Um, we have, you know, the constantly evolving technology. Um, you know, I just talked about the website and it's gonna need redone again mm -hmm. um, in five years. Um, Usually it takes us two and a half years to get it with our expertise to get it to where we need it to be, where it's working like we want it to work. Um, and once you do that, then then it needs upgraded. So um, you have the requir requirements. Um, where are we going with the requirements in that discussion? I, th I think it's just the computing power, you know, that requires more and more mm -hmm. uh, you know, computing power. In yeah. Software needs mm -hmm. and this kind of, mm -hmm. yes. Um, expectations, you know, we, we live in a, a college community. Mm -hmm. um, people are used to seeing things um, one way at, at a, maybe a place who puts in $500,000 or more towards technology and, you know, they expect to see it everywhere. And, you know, we're trying to meet those demands 
and needs. I mean, a good example of that is the reason we really went to online registration was due to expectations. I mean, there was yeah. just an underlying expectation that that is an available service. <clears throat> right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, we were kind of late in the game on that. And a lot of other places that do registrations for programming were already doing it online. So, right. you know, I think we're glad we have that in place, but it just goes to show that these technologies are constantly evolving. Um, external system failures. Um, you know, we, we do have issues at times. Um, we just had one on Saturday. Um, when it happens, when things go down on a Saturday like it did at the Nature Center, um, 1.30 till 4.45, staff could not get on to ex the external world. Um, in fact, I don't even think they could use the intern. I think everything was pretty much down on the computer you know, we're kind of under control of the city. So if the city's not working, um, we don't have a lot of options. Um, so the city could do, usually at lunchtime, the city does a um, backup or a update and the computers have to go down. Well, it, that's the time they need to do it because that works for them. So we are kind of under whenever they need to do things like that they need to do them um, i don't know if you guys remember the first day of crystal lake pool opening mm -hmm. the system <laughs> we had tested it and tested it system was working great saturday morning <laughs> in the middle of the night 2 a.m or something like that they did a java update and our system didn't work the next day, oh, that, that morning when we opened. Mm -hmm. um, Panic. Again, I call that. Mm, Panic. It's terrible. That was one scenario where we did get the city there pretty quickly to try and help us, but we have no control when those things happen. And so one of the things we're working on now is, you know, through MCS or the city having a call person or something, how can we minimize these but i don't think we'll ever eliminate those unless we are fully on our um, own yeah. which I we, just we can't say, afford to do <laughs> if we were i'm assuming we'd have our own internal it issues right. our own collapses or it needs to do this now sorry rec mm -hmm. registration right. folks but you can count on it right Problems do happen. right yeah so <laughs> there's right. i'd say that right. Problems. we do appreciate <laughs> the city we have some limitations and yeah. challenges yeah. but we understand their limitations sure. as well. Another issue we had at the um, outdoor pool was uh, an outside vendor where the access controls, which is the little levers, um, they weren't cooperating with, with the city's requirements, so that caused issues. So again, I think it mainly it was Java updates, but at each time it the access control was with the firewall wasn't allowing the communication between the access control software to our active net software oh. so, and then for I think at least two or three years we had firewall issues before we opened up but oh. had to address that each spring software compatibility bullet point was an example of when we <coughs> transitioned to Windows 7 computers all of a sudden, we also had to update our Adobe software because the version we were on was no longer compatible with Windows 7. So just having your software packages all work together is even an issue um, as we roll out new technologies. I guess really not a whole lot more we haven't mentioned. One thing I would like to point out that has made a, a difference, I believe, and that's the fact that in the last three years, we meet quarterly now with uh, Sanford and, and Sean, mm -hmm. um, which has really helped tremendously as far as mm -hmm. getting everybody on the same page as what, that we need to be at the same technolo technological level as, as they do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's been a great relationship and it, we have challenges, but that's just because there's challenges in right. technology as a whole and no matter if you have your own department, you're still going to have challenges. Um, we're hoping to minimize those yep. downtimes and, and mishaps. Um, I did want to say, you know, at the indoor pool, 
that facility has always been a facility where we've had the philosophy that we take um, it's more loaner equipment or equipment that's come from another facility over there rather than oh, yeah. put a brand new mm -hmm. computer in the system over there for, sure. for the kind of environment it is. Um, we're having discussions now is once we see how the new line works, that may help us, but if not, we may have to take a little bit different philosophy, philosophy on the fact that maybe making sure it's a computer that's not a hand-me-down from the city, maybe it's a hand-me-down from UPD that from is not quite as old, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but th that's some of the challenges as well. We did find, I think that, didn't we find that maybe a VPN line over there was? Yeah, the city actually thinks that that may be part of our challenges across the district. They're experiencing similar challenges at some of their remote facilities like their fire stations and that's one of the things I hope to talk to them tomorrow about. We actually have our quarterly meeting tomorrow and we've been logging all of our issues at various facilities. Well, as, as best as sta staff are able to keep up with it and log it, we've, we've got records and so we'll be reviewing those. Yeah, it's just but yeah, the, the VPNs that were initially installed are now um, several years old and um, they, were, um, they weren't the Cadillac to begin with, so they're, they're, they're due for a replacement. In kind of summary, I was just going to re kind of re remind us how far we have come. I know when I came in 1992, I brought my own lap or desktop. I was the first and only staff that had their own desktop computer. <laughs> the other computer machine was Pat Stebbins, and it was used to put payroll in the um, you know city system that they had. It was an old clickety type keyboard. People actually used to come to me for advice, and obviously that didn't last very long. So we have evolved, and it is okay to laugh. Um, we have a terrific team. You can hear different names, people doing different tasks that might not be their main job, but I think we're pretty confident what we're doing today. We're probably using the resources we have available to us. Um, no doubt if we had two or three IT staff in a department, we could probably advance ourselves, um, you know, much further and faster. Um, but I kind of, it would represent 10% of your staff, so. Probably. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, you know, I, I think we're trying to say, given what we have and what we've come through, we're doing well. However, when the problem happens at whatever facility or situation with a customer, it's never good news, and there's probably no easy or good way to smooth out of that. Um, they're probably not interested in hearing how far we've come um, <laughs> at that point. They just want it resolved, and why did it happen? Why can't you? So I think Katie's comment about a and their comments about community of expectations, it is true. And I think we happen to just be a smaller player. We'll probably continue to be challenged with some of these, but our interest and will is to really get it together and you know, start serving the customers the best way that, that we can. So thank you all. It's very appreciated. Yeah, when we now have a desktop in our pocket, right. it's sort of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> I do want to point out that that one time early on in my tenure here, I had to come in and sign all the paychecks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they didn't come there. wasn't anything, and whoever was supposed to be signing them didn't. Maybe it was Dick Percival. And, mm -hmm. You know, talk about writer's cramp. He still, he still talks about remembering when he used to have to come do that, and <laughs> yes. he's glad he doesn't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Tom, Brown, Tom Brown also was our treasurer, and oh, yeah. he remembers signing every paycheck also. Yep, yep. Come a long, long way. Any other questions? Um, there was no new business. We moved from the consent agenda, so we're down here to comments from commissioners. Anything additional anyone wants to put forward? Hearing none, then I guess we've exhausted our agenda and I'll declare it adjourned. Thank you all.